cooling here and perhaps the thought of water will cool up a little further still. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, begin with the traditional lighting of the oil lamp. To do so then, may I first invite Professor Apudat Senaratna, Vice Chancellor, University of Pennsylvania, together with Mr. Jeremy Bird, Director General, International Water Management Institute, Engineer Major Ms. Sankar Vasudabandara, he is Project Director, Ministry of Technology, Research and Atomic Energy. Mr. Karuna Senanisiara, Chief Chairman, National Water Supply and Drainage Board, Sri Lanka. <coughs> May I also invite Mr. Davindranath Lavare, Chairperson of the Centre for Environment and Justice. Dr. Ajanta Pereira, Founder of the National Programme on Recycling of Solid Waste in Sri Lanka. Ms. Kusum Atukorla, Chairman of the Sri Lanka Water Partnership. Dr. Prabha Palinavadana, Chief Epidemiologist, Central Epidemiological Unit, Ministry of Health. Mr. B. L. O. Mendes, Collaborating Scientist at the Institute of Fundamental Studies, Candy. And Mr. Asanga Abedunasekar, Executive Director of the Lakshman Kagantan Institute. Yes.
like to present a small video on water to your interest.
kann Fahrrad von der Welt verpasst. Ich habe da auch nur 70 Prozent meiner Welt. So what we argue with water is the most abundant compound and why it has to be reserved for the future generation. However, the problem is also water covers the 70% of the earth's surface. The amount of pure and fresh water which can be used by mankind is limited. Therefore, the safety and accessibility for fresh water have been one of the major concerns throughout the world. Preserving the quality of fresh water, fresh and pure water is important for drinking, food production, and recreational water use. It is disregard less than the water should be not be contaminated with infectious agents, toxic chemicals and especially mercury. A few weeks ago, there was an article in the newspaper, I don't know the news of, about the mercury contamination in uh, Sri Lankan water, which is uh, very hazardous. Because the fact that the consumption of water with such infectious uh, have the health risk and may cause cancer and other diseases as well. Therefore, the need of preserving this natural resource is really very important and it has become one of the crucial crises in the globe today. The water resources are local in terms of every single country, but with the scenario of the present day crisis, these water shortages have turned into a global issue. Fast growing such as in Asia, they highly need the access to much more fresh water for their energy sectors. Furthermore, the interim global economy has the possibility to stress on the world's water and it directly can affect the food and energy systems around the world. According to the World Economic Forum on Water, within the next 15-20 years, the worsening water security situation risks may lead to a triggering global food security crisis. As water security is closely linked to food production and energy sectors, the need of a high water security is essential. The water security, energy security and food security are inextricably linked and that the actions in one area can create an impact on the other area. It is true that these linkages have always been present. But with the increasing world population, the demands for the basic services and growing desires have become more obvious and urgent. Therefore, the development in economic and geopolitical forecasts on water is essential for the future reservation of fresh water. The goal of a single water is to ensure all communities to have sustainable access to safe water and sanitation. Thus, it leads to enhance the lives of human beings and their living. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ekin Ladies and gentlemen, if you now see your program, you will see that the afternoon seminar is actually broken up into two parts, session one and two. We will go into the first session right now, and after each session, there will be a chance for questions to be put to the panel, and uh, there can be a panel discussion as well, leading off that. So with that, may I invite the session chairman, Mr. Asanka Abedin-Sekar, to once again come up here, this time as the chairman of the session, session one, and he will be joined up here by Professor Abdul Senaratna, Vice Chancellor of the University of Pennsylvania. Jeremy Burns, Director General, International Water Management Institute. Major Nisanka Vasudevandara, Project Director, Ministry of Technology, Research and Atomic Agency. And Mr. Karunase Adityaraji, Chairman, National Water Supply and Drainage Board of Sri Lanka. That will be session one. And uh, after each gentleman's presentation, we will have a QA session, question session for all of them. Good 
like to call our uh, first speaker, uh, that's Professor Atula Senaratan. I will not be going through their bios because all bios are provided to you, so we will be taking uh, much of the time. So, um, Professor Atula Senaratan, uh, like uh, he will be speaking on what resource of knowledge, uh, the current status. So, so uh, Professor Atula. So if you look at the river outflow, it's about uh, 50 billion cubic meters of 
water into the air into the sea. So balance is 80 billion cubic meters, but this is not properly accounted. So this uh, 80 billion cubic meters of water uh, may lie uh, on the surface of the earth, a part of that, and also uh, where the tanks and lakes and paddy fields, etc., and also a part maybe in the uh, uh, in the form of biomass, biomass water. So what happens to this 80 billion cubic meters of water, the 30 billion evaporates annually. These all are rough estimates just to show you how uh, you can uh, understand how these things are divided among the different uh, components of the environment. So the 30 billion evaporates to make clouds, another 30 billion retain on the surface in the form of uh, tanks and batteries, etc. I told you about earlier. And also the balance between the billion becomes groundwater. So that goes that drains down, so circulates through the soil and becomes groundwater, which is not uh, properly utilized so far. So we have, and also if you look at the number of fuels available in the country and also the uh, quantity that uh, extract from cucumbers and uh, uh, ordinary hardwares, that may be still less than one thousandth of the available groundwater in the country. So you can be assured that we have more than one million. So that is the uh, basic scenario, basic situation of the water data industry in this country. And if you look at the water usage as of the uh, year 2000, so I, I could find the, in the later data anyway, but uh, you look at the two, year 2000 data, but 11 billion of cubic meters uh, used, and you should look at, uh, think back, uh, about 50 billion of uh, river water outflow and 20 billion groundwater, it comes to about 70 billion cubic meters of water. We are using only 11 billion cubic meters annually, uh, out of which we use 90% uh, for agriculture, 7% for domestic use, and 3% for industry. So, still, uh, we have a lot to use. So, uh, if you look at, if you remember the what King Parakrama said, that we shouldn't leave any a drop of water to the sea without being used. So here if you look at this, these numbers, you can see only 11 billion is used uh, out of 70 billion. So still we have some more to be used. So just to give you a uh, basic uh, look at the geomorphology of the country, you can see there are three many plains. 300 meters, up to 1000 meters, and 2420 meters, and these are the area. If you look at the catchment of the water, all these uh, 130 cubic, uh, the billion cubic meters of water falls on this small area, and most of the water that falls on the highlands, drain down to the rivers, and finally, it is in the second, uh, second platform, or second uh, periphery, and it also drains down to the third uh, periphery, the fossil organs. There, it, most of it absorbs into the ground which make uh, making uh, the ground. So this is the geological map. It also uh, gives us some information about the aquifers. Uh, if you look at the Wayne City Partnery from uh, Kutlam to Jaffna, that is, uh, that is a very uh, important uh, aquifer in the country, uh, which carries a lot of water, but a little hard in quality. Uh, but the rest of the country is covered with soil uh, mantle, uh, which also provides a lot of water uh, in the form of uh, shallow ground water. And if you go deep down into the rocks, which are called high earth complex, money complex, and region complex, with very basic uh, uh, the terms we are using here, uh, you will see uh, the deep ground water also provides a uh, reasonable amount of, uh, reasonable fraction of the daily requirements of the country. So, and also the two uh, climatic zones I am not going to uh, tell you more about because this is also play a main role in the quality that we are going to talk about a little later. And quality. So, this is the, the other important thing uh, when you uh, talk about water to take very seriously. The natural composition is the most important thing in water. It depends on the dissolved substances in water. The dissolved substance is always depends on the soluble source in soil where the water is derived from. And, uh, that depends on the process of soil formation. Whatever the solute that may be available in soil depends on the, the, uh, the mechanics of the soil formation which, and also it depends on the type of the rock that the soil is made from. And also the taste of water is 
basically depending on the solutes which are falling above water. So we need to look at all these aspects, the geology, the climate, and the soil and the water quality, all these things are to be taken for consideration. So we are really but we each and next. So that's the next thing that I want to talk about because if the water is drinking in all the elements or the water composition of water is depending on uh, the soil, the where the wells are laid down and also where the, uh, the solutes are coming from the soil. So if you drink something, if you drink water or if you eat something, if so all these things are coming from the ground, obviously we are but we eat and drink. So that is a statement that I can make very to take your uh, attention. So the 30, 70% of Sri Lanka's population depends on backyard water that is domestic pairs. And domestic pairs derive water from the soil. This is like uh, uh, the, the data. Uh, the domestic pairs derive water from the soil and the water derived solutes from the soil. The solutes are products of decomposition of the bedrock. All that we grow on the soil get nutrients from the soil. A major section of our food chain is linked to soil and things growing on it. So what we but we are what we eat and drink, that is why I say, but we are what we eat and drink. So we are what we find on the, in the soil and water. And perhaps here, yeah, because we take uh, up here, so if there is anything in here, that's also going into your body. So we are the environment really, right? in real sense if we uh, speak about. So, you know, at this time I must take you back to 1981, the time that uh, we were just in my cell. I myself, I passed out in 1989 on the University of Perajini, so we uh, didn't have some, uh, a lot to do because we were uh, searching for uh, research. We were just about to start to teach, but we didn't have any experience. So at that time, also the university didn't have much, of, uh, much uh, facilities to do research. So I thought of looking at the available data, available the chemical data or the composition data on water as well as to look at going on uh, those things. Uh, but we, a little while ago we were talking about the, uh, what we eat and drink. So I wanted to look at the water quality and health. So uh, gather some information, information available at the medical statisticians office in Kalambo. So I collected 70 years or uh, 30 years of uh, uh, data of diseases, the incidences of uh, various diseases. And also I put them together into different districts and provinces as well and also uh, try to correlate in the co composition of both in those areas. And to my, to my surprise, I found uh, the cardiovascular diseases, nobody expected that uh, would be uh, the outcome of the research, the cardiovascular diseases among people in Sri Lanka are related negatively with the hardness of water. So, as a non-medical man, I didn't know why, but uh, for the sake of the interest, I published that paper uh, in, a, in a British journal, and finally, what happened was, I was awarded a scholarship from the Imperial College of Science and Technology. So that finally, it is a mind because at that time, there nobody said that uh, high vascular diseases had some relationship with hardness of water. But anyway, that was there. So it's still, nobody could explain very correctly how it happens. But there are some clues. Uh, some say, some doctors say that maybe magnesium in hard water, uh, uh, keeping the fat in black stream in solution. So that may be a uh, reason uh, for the cap capability of magnesium to keep fat in solution. That may be the reason. So that is still, still to be uh, researched about. So uh, another matter that we found in that time in late 1970s, the influence of fluoride. So the fluoride, uh, uh, a clever lecturer from the Taylor in the university, he looked at uh, in the dental faculty really, the fact that the dental students had, some dental students had problems in their teeth, uh, the teeth modeling and teeth uh, fluorosis, the yellowing. So uh, this professor, this lecturer wanted to collect their addresses and uh, finally when, they, when it was sorted, the, the addresses of these students, so printed on the map, they found all these places of origin are from Anurag. So this clever person uh, thought that this must be from Anuradhapur or something restricted to Anuradhapur area and they took some samples from water from Anuradhapur area and found to be very high in fluoride. So there it came up and that is the first time that uh, the fluoride, the fluorosis was declared uh, occurring in Sri Lanka and the re reason for fluorosis is fluoride in groundwater. But later, 
the journey department we took up the challenge that we did analysis of water from the uh, entire country and we found it is not only in Anurag for India but the fluoride is available in like, uh, high concentration uh, everywhere in the dry zone. The reason for that is not uh, as uh, ascribed before uh, the fluoride in appetite in Anuradhapura here this time myself and Dr. Dharadhuradhan here we declared that fluoride is not coming only from appetite it is from the mica because the entire country is rich in trucks called biotite nicers the biotite the mineral carries a lot of fluoride in it so when it decomposes and becomes soil then fluoride goes into soil finally ending up in your uh, uh, glass of water. So that is how it happens. But these things are known knowledge here, the general clear is and when you don't have enough fluoride in water, uh, it promotes general clear is uh, and if you have sufficient uh, fluoride in your water or even you are using toothpaste with uh, fluoride so you are that promotes dental health and if you have more fluoride it tends to uh, make dental fluorosis and if you have more fluoride, further more fluoride you will find skeletal fluorosis and it can be even deadly. So this is a picture of a person having uh, the fluorosis, these things are not new, but these are photographs that we have taken, so my interest that I have uh, presenting it here. And, uh, and also here, this person I met in Tantri Malay about uh, 10 years back, but he is grown up now, but you look, uh, you look at his team, he, at his state he is having uh, this much of fluorosis, and this is skeletal fluorosis, evidence of skeletal fluorosis and this is also uh, skeletal fluorosis that is uh, this one is not from Sri Lanka but uh, this can happen in Sri Lanka too and this is another problem uh, where the, as I told you the what you drink that is what you are so this is there yeah, it's not getting from the things that you uh, consume this is because you do not have sufficient quantities of iodine in your diet uh, and this is, this is a problem that I am also suffering with, the kidney stones and you can see these kidney stones are cut into slices, you can see the different layering into stones that indicate uh, the time when you are aging, uh, your stone also gets, uh, uh, you know, getting old with that. Every year there's like three lines in, uh, in the winter and summer, your stone also produces uh, layers depending on the the, the type of water that you have to consume, not only water, the type of water and food that you are consuming. And these are different, uh, uh, different places, different, uh, uh, different samples here uh, shown. And that means the natural composition is not a test. Now we have an understanding that we think that all what we think naturally is the best for you, but it is not always true because natural water may not be always good for you because it may, it may carry the things that I have uh, described as you by the The two, it may be the too soft or too hard, the water may be. The softer you get, you, uh, the water you drink, you like it, but that is not good for your health. You don't get your nutrients, right? And if you drink hard water, you may get uh, kidney stones and other stones here and there in the body. At the same time, it may prevent you having a heart attack. So these are good things and the bad things. And uh, and also uh, high in chloride, you know. The, uh, and also we did this ground. That is the groundbreaking research that I was uh, telling you about: this cardiovascular diseases and uh, water quality. And the other species here, yeah, there are. Uh, uh, large number of research publications published by the University of Peralini researchers on water alone. So that is you can carry from the uh, front table and you can have access to all these journals. These are all uh, uh, the international and referee journals and a lot of uh, knowledge available in those publications. You can go and also you can make use of, uh, make use of this information for your future research in both. And this is that the geological map that I was uh, referring uh, to earlier. Uh, you can see how complicated that is. That the so geological map indicates the rocks, the distribution of rocks. So you may understand the rocks if you are there. Are geologists here, of course, you understand all the thousand and one types of uh, rocks available on here. But if you are not, you can just identify a rock from uh, 
blue color, a black one, a white rock, a blue color, a blue color, the, uh, the calcareous rock and things like that, a blue color, a valley color like that, sandstone, things like that. But these are not like that, so it's complicated. So we have uh, uh, a proper scientific uh, identification for each and every rock, and also we have a different methods of uh, analysis of rocks. Now this, this map alone will tell you how complicated the geology of a country can be. So this is still a very small country, but still we have more than 1000 different types of rocks. So next is uh, the soil map. So you can see that it's also very uh, complicated. Complicated in the sense, just like the geology is complicated, the soil is compli complicated naturally. The reason is, the soil is away from the rocks. And if you have one rock somewhere, you can expect one type of soil, naturally. But if you have one rock and two different types of climatic soils, you can have two different kinds of soil. If you have 100 rocks and two different kinds of climate, you can have 200 different kinds of rocks. So imagine you have thousands and thousands of different kinds of rocks and two or three different climatic zones in the country. So you can imagine the different kinds of soils you can expect. So agriculturists are very clever, so they have different uh, types of uh, classification, but for geochemists, for geochemists, you can find many millions of different types of soils on this earth. So this is the, uh, the complexity of the soil map of the country. And now, so this will show you a uh, geochemical classification of groundwater. In fact, this was made in 19, early 1980s uh, at the time that we did have much of uh, uh, sophisticated equipment. Uh, but still, you find so many different kinds of water, but, but you may find a lot of different kinds of rocks and soil, but if you categorize the water that you may analyze into several groups, you will find there are only about uh, 10 different kinds of uh, water types, but still distributed uh, irregularly uh, throughout the country. And these are showing another type of distribution, is the distribution of nitrate, the distribution of total hardness of the country. And if you go back to your uh, memory in uh, climate exports, you can see some, some, uh, the, the, some resemblance of these maps. There is an area, the southwestern area, a similar, uh, similar types of zones there, which implicates, which implies the climatic zone, the wet zone, is having less hardness, less chloride, less dissolved soil, sorry, uh, less total hardness, and high in nitrate. That is the risk for a different reason. High in nitrate means that more of people living in the red soil, and uh, and also this runs along the term can road maybe uh, maybe or something is not that good. But anyway, that indicates that there, is, there are more people living in the ground water soil contaminated in more nitrate in groundwater. And these are the same, different kinds. And this is fluoride distribution. You can see, if you uh, go back to your climatic uh, map again, you will see that the big uh, resemblance of the uh, dry zone, wet zone uh, boundary here also you can see that. And the dry zone is carrying more fluoride than uh, in the wet The Putra to Jasna area, all the uh, limestone areas, you don't get any fluoride. Uh, the lucky people, they don't have any fluoride bearing minerals in the area, which is uh, monomineral uh, sort of rock that is calcite basically that, that, that doesn't carry uh, fluoride so you don't get fluoride in the rock, you don't get fluoride in the soil so you don't get fluoride in your water. That is why area for Putran to Jaffa is devoid of fluoride. And new knowledge. Now, if you look at what is the new knowledge that you need, you have a lot of knowledge already in the shelf. What you need is to do more research on the areas that you may find people. Now here the treated water supply is in upper trend. Now, uh, earlier I remember at the time we had only about 5 or 6 percent treated water supply for the whole country. Now it's went up to about 20 percent. But in time to come, you may find about 50 percent of the people in this country will be provided with uh, treated water. With the increase in the treated water supply, you may find that the backyard water's uh, role in your health diminishes. So it is not any more important because you get treated water or amended water, so that quality is uh, uniform, common to everyone. So you cannot find any relationship between the disease and the water quality uh, 
uh, as we do it now. So in the future, you have some other areas to look at. So just like I said, the more people exposed to treated or quality amended water or uniform quality. So the majority depends on that. In fact, that is what it is today. And that is why the research and development on household treatment units are required because the people depend on their uh, backyard water, so we must provide them with some treatment devices. They are the uh, unnecessary elements, unnecessary uh, things in your water must be eliminated. So you need some treatment uh, uh, devices. And also you must need, you must have a regulatory mechanism to test filtering devices. In the market you may, you may find several a uh, large number of uh, water filters, but nobody knows the outcome. So if you put some water in, you will get something out. And you, you, you believe that the, what the, uh, the, the producer says is right, so drink that water. But you, know, you don't know what is really happening inside that filter. You may drink worse water than what you, but the water that you put in. So it is better to have some regulatory mechanism uh, from the government or from the state to look at the, uh, the quality of these devices. And these are some of the devices that made in Sri Lanka by the water supply and the lake board and these are really working. I also uh, took part in the making of these uh, filters some time back. Mm, so these are uh, usable and also uh, dependable filters uh, introduced by Mr. Um, after of the water supply and the port, and we, we were in the same system as well. And this is the list that I was referring to. And this one is very important. Now, this is a new book written by uh, two members of our staff, my uh, university, my department of geology, uh, one from the Chandra Visayanayak and from the Rohana Chandraji. They wrote this book, this is a textbook, Introduction to Medical Geology. It's a new area of research. The whole world. So this is a textbook, not in only in Sri Lanka, in many other countries, including European and American states, and also in Japan. This book is uh, uh, taken to as a textbook in the universities where are the, uh, where the the medical faculties as well as the uh, science based faculties. Now the the future research needs, as I told you, the relevance of water quality may diminish with more treated water supply, I told you uh, earlier, and also food supply, but the food supply continues to depend on natural water. So where the water is not treated. So your beans, your rice, your um, whatever, right, your, uh, the, the food supplies are not treated, so water is not treated, your cow is not getting treated water, so you have to be very careful, the milk that comes from the cow. So you are, when I say, uh, when you are looking at the food supply, it is not coming from the supermarket, so you have to, uh, depend, you are depending on the natural uh, food of natural origin, so you have to be very careful. No? So I am very proud to say that the universities are very busy in their laboratories, and also uh, water supply and the food and water resources board are working on uh, the, the problems, the day-to-day -day problems, and currently more funding for water research, and that is the, uh, that is all what I have to say. Uh, so if you do have a job, need not to worry about the data of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I'm sure you have some questions and uh, also uh, some ideas which we will discuss at uh, the end of the session. So I will call upon our second speaker, as Mr. Jeremy Byrne, the Director General of International Water Management Institute. Give you the speak about water security, adapting to changing context. Okay, thank you very much, Sank, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to speak here on behalf of the International Water Management Institute this afternoon on this topic which is an incredibly emotive subject that's been given to us now on a day without water. If we just conjure up our minds what that might mean to us. I mean, you know, we go home and we find that the tap doesn't work in our kitchen or something like that. But for, for many people, uh, for many people, you know, it's not, we're not able to overcome that sort of problem. For us, well, we would go out and we buy a bottle of water in the, in the, in the store. But, uh, Many other people just don't have that opportunity because uh, of the situation that they're in. So let's just imagine it's not just about 
the physical quantity of water. And we heard just now that, well, in fact, Sri Lanka has uh, more than enough water. But it's also about the condition of that water. Is it in the right place? Is it of the right quality? Is it uh, you know, affordable to make available to, to people? And so, uh, you know, this is another scenario. The world without water for you know, many people who rely upon these sorts of drinking wells, and as we've seen in that, uh, in that video, travel miles to, to get that sort of water. So that's an issue around water quantity. It's also an issue around water quality. And the water that is available may not be in a condition that you can actually use it. But if you do use it, then it provides, it, it leads to those sorts of health problems that we've, uh, we've seen, both in the movie and in the last presentation. And then also for farmers, you know, if you don't get water at the right time, then it can actually then disrupt your, your ability to be able to provide the crops to support your families and, uh, and to take the market. So it's more than just about physical water scarcity. You know, we look at security of water in three different dimensions. We look at it in terms of also, you know, is it a physical scarcity? Is it an economic scarcity because you don't have the wherewithal or the resources to be able to develop the water and have the infrastructure to take it to the place where it's needed? Or is it an institutional scarcity? I mean, the water's there, the finance is there, but basically the structures, the regulatory environment, the management structures, the institutions are not there and doing their job in terms of getting to the water to where it needs to be. So this is our challenge in uh, facing the world at the moment. You can dispute the numbers, but overall the impression is the same. Nine billion people need to be fed by 2050. An increase in water requirements of roughly 70 percent. And at the same time, it's no, no longer just an issue of, well, let's do that without having an impact on the environment. We have to do that with reversing the degradation that's already taking place on the environment, the degradation to surface water, to soil resources, and to groundwater. Now, so that also leads to this idea of practice in terms of food and nutrition, we need to have another green revolution. And here we're calling it the second sort of double green revolution because it's not just about crop varieties and developing new varieties which should be higher yielding, which we know are having a big impact in Sri Lanka already. We're seeing, we see later, that the, the yields of uh, paddy rice, for example, have been sustainably increased over the years here in Sri Lanka to reach self sufficiency in the last few years. It's also about how we manage the ecosystems upon which agriculture and the rest of us depend to ensure that for our, uh, our children and grandchildren we don't see these sorts of services, ecosystems uh, deteriorating to a point in which they cannot and no longer support agriculture. We're seeing, you know, we have elements of water and land scarcity, uh, slow growth and productivity in many areas, inequity in terms of sharing of benefits, and the unequal sharing of risks around water. To say, in this room, you know, we can obviously buy our way out of a problem in terms of water. But for many people in the slides that we've seen, that is not, not an option. Also, we see that the pace of change here, in, and this is a slide actually from Southeast Asia, not from South Asia, but it's very similar here. The pace of change in terms of demands upon land and demands upon water is significantly greater than happened in the West. And so, therefore, the need to be able to adapt and change uh, to those uh, different pressures when it comes to population increase, urbanization, industrialization, are much more imminent than, uh, than it was the case in the West. And the same thing as we see as economies develop, as Sri Lanka has become a middle income country, as with many other countries, the, the consumption of meat and milk increases, and with that, the demands upon water increase. You see the the exponential rise there in terms of the consumption of milk in, uh, in India and meat in China having significant impacts upon the demands on water. So as this article says, it's not so much about water scarcity, it's about the way in which we manage the water, and that's, that's the issue that's before us. Really. And as part of this whole discussion around the follow-up to the Millennium Development Goals after 2015, the UN is looking at, well, what should go at this place? What should be the future targets that we're looking at? And should water, beyond water supply to communities and individuals, be a part of one of those metrics that we're looking at to, to gauge uh, our development of success? And here, looking at the sustainable development goals for water, and water security is one of those many ideas that's been put up as a proposal 
for one of what's what being called the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is the best definition derived by the UN Water, uh, which brings into play most of those elements I've been talking about. Quantity, quality, protection of the ecosystem, sustainability, and in fact, the climate of peace and stability, which if any countries means more cooperation around the way we manage our water. Um, that's at a relatively high level of aggregation. The Asian Development Bank and the Asian Pacific Forum have then looked at how to break that down into different elements. And on World Water Day this year, they launched uh, the Asian Development Water Outlook, which then breaks it down into five elements of household water security, urban water security, economic water security, which I talked about, the resilience to water disasters, which again we'll come back to here, which is very prevalent in the case of Sri Lanka, and then environmental water security and the opportunities to recover river systems and groundwater systems. And then for each of those five elements, they unpack it all and they did quite an extensive bit of research to, to see, well, where do the different countries lie and what are the different elements of those five components which really should be the focus of investment decisions. So right here I've just shown one in terms of water security and governance and, uh, uh, in, and it's, it's lying in the same sort of area as the Philippines, as Thailand, as Fiji and China, significantly ahead as in, uh, in other parts of South Asia. So basically the, uh, the vertical axis talks about one sort of uh, uh, a bit of exposure to, to water security and disasters and then the ability of a government to be able to respond in terms of their governance regime, which is well back in the case of governance index on the, on the, on the x-axis. Similarly for water rate and hazards, you know, looking at uh, exposure to hazards and the ability and the resilience of the community to respond to those, to those hazards. And here we just see uh, a picture of the scale of, of the impacts on the Lanka. Uh, whether it's drought, drought, which is in, uh, in blue, or flood, which is in green, and this does not include the, the tsunami uh, event, just to show that you know, there are these periodic instances which are having a major impact upon individual communities. 2008 uh, flood there affecting almost 2 million people in some, in some respect. I mentioned rice crop sufficiency, and certainly you can see that in the last few years that, that uh, uh, Sri Lanka has been able to be self-sufficient in rice, and the question then is would it manage to maintain that position given the growing population and what are the steps being taken to, to do that. But on the other area, is this sufficient? Is the rice self-sufficiency the right, the right policy? Should also be looking at the improvement of non-rice products, uh, higher value crops, export crops, which have a higher economic value. A lot has been talked about around groundwater, and uh, this is the uh, Chunakam aquifer up in, uh, in Jaffna, and some work that we did a uh, couple of years ago, looking at the risks associated with over-exploitation of the aquifer. Now this sequence of slides is going to show you the impact of abstraction of groundwater from, from a number of different wells, many of which are located around the coastal fringe. So you see that at the top end of the, the, uh, the chart there, that's the, that's the sea on the northern part of the Jaffa Peninsula and on the western side. And as you go through the year, from January through the year, you see the abstractions increasing. And then what we're looking at here is the electrical conductivity of the water in the ground which is actually a proxy measure for the degree of salinity. And the salinity is coming from the intrusion from, from the sea. So as you abstract water, you know, the salinity in those areas increases. Increases to an extent where it's no longer usable for agriculture and for, for drinking water. And Jaffna being an area where there is no alternative water supply apart from groundwater, this, together with the other questions around nitrates and other pollutants, raises questions about the sustainability of the way in which that is being managed at the moment and whether these considerations are being taken into account in the planning of the rehabilitation activities. So whether you're a skeptic about global warming or not, I think there's one thing we can say that there will be less predictability and more variability around the way we use the water, rainfall and the water resources in the country. And here's some work that we did uh, a couple of years ago also pointed to those areas which were particularly at risk. 
So particularly the north, eastern, and eastern dry zones may become even more may even drier, requiring more water for irrigation. Uh, soil moisture deficits will grow, particularly because of the, uh, the longer periods of dry between rainfall events and the, perhaps the later onset of the rains. And in the upper areas, in the hill countries, less rainfall will mean less recharge of the reservoirs and more competition than between hydropower use and irrigation. And traditionally in Sri Lanka, we have an amazing ancient civilization, hydraulic civilization, based around these sorts of tank cascade systems you see near Anuradhapura. And you know, they have been successful in terms of providing a relatively integrated approach for the management of land and water. But as pressures grow and, and uh, watersheds are developed, groundwater is extracted from those areas, uh, as systems become less operational, are neglected, they silt up, as pressures on uh, industry and uh, urban development grow, you see maybe there's a rethink into how these sorts of systems need to be used. Yes, they need to be rehabilitated, but do they need to be rehabilitated back to the situation they were when they were designed? Or do we need to take into account other opportunities and possibilities there? And this is one another one of the challenges facing uh, some of these planning decisions in Sri Lanka at the moment. For example, one piece of work we did in, in South India showed that in many cases you could also use some of these tank systems to recharge the groundwater. And that was a more reliable way of distributing the water, which could then be pumped up for irrigation uses. Clearly, it has an energy consideration, but overall, there seems to be a more equitable solution for, for the farmers downstream. Uh, so, storage is a major opportunity for uh, adapting to climate change, but at the same time, we're not talking about necessarily large reservoirs. We're talking about a whole menu of different options from groundwater recharge, soil moisture, we're looking at uh, rainwater harvesting, we're looking at reuse of uh, polluted, polluted water uh, as well. So the question then is where do we fit in, in a particularly local context on this spectrum between rainfall and irrigating? And Sri Lanka, given the sort of variability that there is here in the climate and the weather, you will see that there will have to be different options which are appropriate for different situations. So now let me come to a few solutions around these ideas of water security. And this builds on some of the work we've done from other countries. And the first one is from, from India, where they have a situation of over-abstraction of groundwater in the areas around Gujarat, Rajasthan, Punjab. And you see uh, excessive uses of groundwater in those, in those areas, caused by an electricity subsidy. Almost free electricity provided to agricultural users which then let them use, leave the pumps on for 24 hours uh, and just go away and do other activities. It resulted in not only overuse of electricity, overuse of water, lowering groundwater tables, but very inefficient and unreliable electricity supplies for communities because there was too much electricity being demanded by agriculture. And the World Bank and others have been strongly suggesting that, well, let's just reduce the subsidy which was the logical economic argument to, to resolve this problem, increase pricing, and the farmers will respond to that signal. But politically, this was just not acceptable. Uh, no politician in India and Gujarat was supposed to take that decision. So after some time, they looked, well, let's take another option. Let's look out of the box and see if there's another alternative solution here. And the idea was to, on a trial basis, to separate out the electricity feeder lines that go to the pumps, the agriculture, to those which go to the domestic and industrial commercial uses. Completely different separate uh, feeder lines, one at 220 volts and one at 330 volts. And the agricultural lines were then rationed eight hours a day, and 24-7 supply was given to the domestic users. This then led to a recovery in uh, ground tables, a reduced amount of electricity, and the third win was actually an increase in yields because there was no more water logging, there was better water management. So this has now been uh, replicated in a number of other states and becoming a uh, policy for these over-abstracted states in India. A second one is whether we can actually look at polluted water not as a problem so much as a, an opportunity. And we know that these sorts of contaminated situations are being used in many countries for irrigation, particularly in peri-urban areas. 
but he's putting the irrigators at risk because of health concerns of the contaminated water, and also the, con the consumers because of the uptake of those pathogens in the, in the vegetables. So again, these places, they cannot afford to have the major, a large scale in investments in, in water infrastructure that, uh, that we would normally see in the West. So we can see that in many mega cities, that infrastructure development just cannot keep up with the pace of the development of those cities. And these are just the numbers, you know, looking at the amount of uh, separate waste which is going into the groundwater, it's going into wetland areas, it's going into the river systems, because it's certainly not going into a treatment plant. So, what sort of solutions were available? And we looked at a number of different business models around this, and uh, for the, for the wastewater, the idea was then to see if we could identify a few uh, interventions like some retention storage, small scale retention storage, moving from using watering cans which splash the water everywhere to using low head drip systems to reduce the transmission of the pathogens um, and a number of other techniques. For the waste of solid waste, the solid waste which is collected from the septic tanks and then dumped into the, into the wetlands to actually collect it, to dry it, to compost it, to pelletize it under pressure, and then sell it as a fertilizer which has at least as good uh, agricultural um, benefits as the uh, chemical fertilizers. So again, these are some new ideas which are coming out, and WHO and uh, USAID and FAO and others have started uh, incorporating a number of these uh, techniques now into their, into their guidelines. The third and last one I'm going to talk about is around uh, irrigated agriculture. Irrigated agriculture for the last 20 years has been a bit of a, an orphan for the development banks. They haven't really been putting much money into it after the 1990s. But now it's coming back onto the agenda. And there is a big, I think, opportunity there. An opportunity in Asia to increase the efficiency of water from surface water systems. And an opportunity in sub-Saharan Africa particularly to expand into areas that weren't uh, irrigated before. But we also know there's many problems, institutional problems, rehabilitation issues, etc. But these are some of the questions of the, the issues. We know that 80 to 90% of increases in productivity are going to have to come from existing cultivated areas. And probably about 10 to 20% are going to come from reclaiming land which is degraded, maybe through saline salinity. And there are solutions. I mean, the third, this third solution I'm offering here is looking at some work based on the challenges between agriculture and urban water use in China. With urban expansion, the urban areas industry needed more water. The obvious place to take it was from agriculture.